We begin tonight with breaking news. A scare on a pre-K 4SA campus. A gun was found in a three year old child's backpack this morning. This happened at the pre-K 4SA West Education Center on Enrique Barrera Parkway. No one here was hurt, though San Antonio police late this afternoon would not confirm whether that gun was loaded. Here's what we know about what happened. San Antonio police say a teacher told an off duty officer working at the school about that gun. CPS was also contacted. The child says they did not know that gun was in their backpack. Police say they've tried to get in contact with the child's father, but have not yet heard back. In a statement, the head of pre K 4 SA says effective immediately backpacks are no longer allowed at any of its campuses. She said in part, quote, we know that young children sometimes bring items from home without understanding whether the item is potentially dangerous. She went on to say that the pause on backpacks is temporary until they figure out a long term solution. For now, parents are asked to send children's belongings in a clear Ziploc bag and pre K 4 SA says if you need those bags, you can reach out to your students teacher. New information on 80 animals seized from a home. Bear County officials say many of the dogs rescued from that puppy mill earlier this month are now ready to be adopted. Deputies say a 79 year old man ran that puppy mill where they found those 80 animals. Daniela Ibarra tells us how those dogs are doing now and if anyone is being held accountable. Five-year-old Valerie is building up her strength. She's a sweet girl. The blue healer is now a mom to eight one-week-old puppies. <laughs> they were born at this triage center where Bear County veterinarians treated about 60 other dogs rescued back on August 3rd from a Southwest Bear County puppy mill. Pretty deplorable situation that we found these animals in. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the 79-year-old homeowner kept the dogs outside in kennels, feeding them bread and water. Nearly two weeks later, nobody has been arrested and the sheriff's office is still investigating. It was a lot. Animal control officer Gianna Cortez cataloged all the animals. It was very sad. Um, you could tell a lot of the animals hadn't been handled in a very long time. Brandon Hollenbach, a live animal outcome specialist, has been caring for them. We're scared of the world, um, but that's our job to kind of have them uh, ease them into, you know, a loving environment. A dozen of the dogs are at Bear County's animal facility in Kirby. The rest are with area rescue groups. Besides overgrown nails and flea and tick infestations, the county says most of the dogs are pretty healthy. They're in a much better spot now. Valerie and her eight puppies aren't available for adoption yet, but several of the dogs rescued from that puppy mill are. So if you're interested in adopting one of them, come by the facility and check them out for yourself. Daniele Barra, Case at 12 News. San Antonio police trying to figure out what led up to a shooting that sent a 17 year old to the hospital. That shooting happened around 830 this morning on Moss Circle Drive. That's on the southwest side between I-35 and Southwest Military. SAPD says a woman and her son were outside their home when someone in a silver car drove up and started shooting. The teenager was taken to a hospital in critical condition. One neighbor says she heard at least 20 shots. Meantime, SAPD also investigating after a woman was found dead along a highway this morning and officers believe she'd been hit by several cars. This was the scene from a trans guide camera around noon today at I-37 near Loop 1604 South. Officers found the woman's body around 1030 this morning. No word yet on what exactly happened here. We now know the name of a woman killed in a house fire last month on the southwest side. She's been identified as 82 year old Alicia Guajardo. That fire happened at a home on Ross Avenue near South Zarzamora Street. No word from San Antonio, the fire department on the cause yet, but fire officials did tell us that home did not have any working smoke detectors. San Antonio City Council members and community members alike are digging into the proposed $3.7 billion city budget proposal. Top city staff presented that record budget last week. Council is expected to pass a final version in just under a month from now. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger was there today as they started their work sessions. And Garrett, it sounds like they like the look of things so far. They certainly do, Myra, at least from today's work session, which focused in on public works and the airport system. The second of which is one of the main drivers that have really caused this budget's price tag to take off. 
Now, the airport system is more than tripling its budget for capital projects over what it had last year, with more than $291 million earmarked for that. Much of it is the city tries to tackle its plans to develop the airport, including with a new terminal. But the airport system has not figured out how it will end up funding more than half of that m- amount. As it stands, they'll borrow the money until they can figure out a long-term plan. But the director of airport says they will not be turning to your local tax dollars. Any money will come out of their grants or airport revenues. Unless you use the airport, you don't pay for the airport. Um, we're not asking for any general fund dollars to perform this. All that comes from our aeronautical and non-aeronautical revenues, uh, passenger facility charges that, that, that are there, and um, we continue to grow our revenue. So from our standpoint, all of that comes from funding in the airport. It's not just the council members who are getting a closer look at the budget. The city started its series of budget town halls last night, the pair of meetings on the south and northwest sides. A panel of city staff from various departments answered questions from audience members. Police, animal care services, and speed bumps among the questions people had. You got to be part of the table. You got to be at the table because if you're not at the table, you'll be there dinner. The next budget town hall is actually scheduled for just over just under half an hour from now at the Northeast Senior Center that's up on Thousand Oaks Drive. We've got the full schedule of all the town halls and to, and public hearings on our website. Just find the budget stories on KSAT.com. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Garrett, thank you. Now to an update on the coronavirus. There's been a big increase in local COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. San Antonio Metro Health reported more than 1,600 new cases this week. That is a 387% increase from the start of July. University health doctors say this bump in activity follows a summer trend across the country. The strain behind most of these new cases is, is an Omicron subvariant. It's called EG.5. A new vaccine booster expected to be released this fall is targeting these subvariants. It'll be available by October, but they do want people to wait right now so they get this updated booster, which will more closely match what's circulating. Most people have already been exposed to some of these Omicron subvariants, and the most recent booster dose also contain that as well. Now, despite the increase in cases, Metro Health tells us that hospitalizations are still low. They have pop-up clinics for people who are looking for vaccines, and you don't have to register for that. We have a link to all that information at KSAT.com. Now to the latest on the wildfires in Maui. The death toll is still rising. 99 people now have died, and we know that 90% of the structures destroyed were homes. Today also marks one week since those fires started. People who live on the island want to return and assess the damage, but Maui officials suspended an access plan after just one day, saying that too many people who don't live on the island are trying to get access. It's just hard and unbelievable. My dad's still there. There's certain things that he still needs that we need to get to him specifically, um, like medicine. Right now, only 25% of the burn area has been searched by rescue teams. Hawaii's governor, though, says he expects up to 90% of that area to be searched by Sunday. In Hawaii, the word ohana means family, and that extends through all the islands. As the people of Maui cope with these devastating fires, their ohana across the country in the ocean is sending help. Courtney Freeman spoke to Hawaiians right here in San Antonio who are doing all they can for their loved ones back home. At LNL Hawaiian Barbecue in San Antonio, it doesn't just smell like Hawaii, it feels like it too, the warmth and connection. You don't need to be a blood relative because our culture transcends biology. So we are all connected through the culture. Sarah Yee was born and raised in Oahu, but has long been the franchise owner of two LNL restaurants in San Antonio. Relative to LNL, our primary restaurant in Lahaina was burned to the ground. We were able, thank, thank goodness, to account for all the employees. The franchisee owner lost his house and his family members lost their homes. The thing about our Hawaiian people is that we, we, we're going to take care of each other. 
Hawaiian musician Kainoa Kamaka began partnering with LNL nine years ago and is now like family. He's from the big island of Hawaii where almost his entire family is, but his brother is a doctor on Maui. He's now not only taking care of his patients, but he's been called to go to the hospitals. The hospitals and shelters full of people injured in the fires, and they need support. The second Friday of every month here at LNL is called Aloha Friday, and now it will become a continuous fundraiser for the people of Maui, 25% of proceeds going to that community. On top of Aloha Fridays, they'll keep a donation jar at the register for the foreseeable future. There's a word that Hawaiians use. We use imua, which means to move forward. So in times of this distress, we like to come together. A culture of resilience, unbreakable, no matter how far away they may be. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And you know San Antonians will help out. Back here at home, look outside with live cam. Another triple digit day to rack up as we're, we're on a roll, shall we say. Here, Adam. On a roll we don't want to be on, but yeah, we're still but rolling, <laughs> that's for are. sure. Yep, and it was our 50th 100 degree day, so we're still in fourth place for the all-time count, but we're going to keep tallying up. 103 the high today, average is 97, the record 104. Actually, a little bit of activity on the radar screen. We'll talk about this and where we could see a few more showers pop up in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. Let's take a look at traffic out there. Highway 90 at Couples. Don't you wish that glare off the roadway was actually rain? Something wet from the sky, but it's not. Traffic slow going, uh, no real issues to make you aware of in either direction here from this view. Still ahead on the news at six, housing costs are soaring. So which is better, to buy or to rent? The expenses that come with both. We take a look at that debate next. Here's what's coming up tonight on the night beat. A wildfire disaster declaration is forcing first responders to rethink how they respond to rural fires. Tonight on the night beat, how crews in Comal County are staying ready for disaster while dealing with the extreme heat themselves. Plus, while San Antonio homeowners are under water restrictions in this drought, homeowners in one north side neighborhood say water has been spewing near their houses for months. What Saws is saying about that and what's taking them so long to go fix it. That's tonight at 10. Housing costs are incredibly high right now. According to Nerd Wallet, the mortgage rates in San Antonio are at their highest level in 20 years. So what's better, to rent or to own? Max Massey breaks down the debate. I went from an $1,800 a month payment to a $3,300 a month payment, but I knew back then that it was important for me to start investing in my future. Ronnie Trevino is a realtor with Keller Williams Heritage. He knows firsthand all of the expenses that come with owning a home and how those monthly mortgage payments can be more than renting. Why it is that they're buying and the strategy of buying versus renting. He's seen the highest of the highs. So back during the pandemic, we were basically taking orders. There were so many people that just wanted to buy housing. And he's seen the lowest of the lows. I started the business in 2008 when we had the biggest real estate crash of the nation. And I'm not seeing that same pattern today. But we're seeing now the effects of interest rates on people buying and selling homes. People don't want to give up 3% mortgages to get a 7% mortgage. David McPherson teaches economics at Trinity University. He tells me the housing prices, they can continue to fall. There's already been a slow decline in housing prices. It's just not as rapid as one would think would happen, given the hike in interest rates. The thought is that housing prices are still too high, and there's a lot of room for them to come back down. I'd be more inclined to rent and save at the higher savings rates because rents have come down too. Like most matters, it's probably best not to time the market. Now, when you look at rental costs here in San Antonio, it's $1,725 median. It's actually cheaper than it was a year ago. And this could be more cost effective, especially short term when you factor in repairs to the home and closing costs. But a house, that could be a better long term investment. You're saving for the future and you're, you're, you're putting your money into an investment just like you would a 401k. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Okay, there is some excitement in the studio right now because there is something on the radar and it's not bats. 
It's not bats it's for not a change, bats. right? <laughs> we have actual <laughs> precipitation, <gasps> hydrometeors on the radar. Is that also called rain? Yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> It is. Okay, so let, let's get right to it. And it's all west of San Antonio, and it's really starting to fizzle out for the most part. But over the past few hours, we've had some stray little pop up showers and even weak thunderstorms. Southern Edwards County, parts of Valverde County, especially up the Devil's River, and just outside of Brackettville as well. Generally north of Highway 90 here, even a bit of an outflow boundary developed. And you look at the actual rainfall estimates by the Doppler radar and west of 277 in Valverde County up the Devil's River nearly an inch or about an inch estimated by radar north of Brackettville up to about three quarters of an inch. So in some very rural areas, you got a nice little soaking of rain and there is a slight chance through 9 p.m. that we could see a few more showers pop up elsewhere, but we're thinking mainly south of San Antonio and south of Highway 90. And our feature cast is showing that notice at 7 p.m. I think it's a little aggressive with what it shows here. I wouldn't count on this, but it just shows that potential that there could be a few more popping up all the way through 9 p.m. And then the sky clears out and it's just going to be more of the same the next few days with a little bit of a pattern shift by next week. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Earlier, we talked about our 50th 100 degree day so far this year. We're still in fourth place. However, today was our 17th consecutive 100 degree day. So that puts us in second place for the most 100 degree days in a row. We're making the run for 21, which was set back in 1962. Currently 102, so down one degree from our high. A dew point is 61. So a fairly typical dew point for this time of day in August. The winds out of the northeast, though, that's unique. Typically, it's southeast. That weak cold front that's moving through, helping to kickstart some of those showers out west. It's also shifting our wind a little bit, and it's going to tamp down the humidity a little bit tonight, a little bit compared to how thick the humidity normally is. Looking at temperatures, we actually stayed in the upper 90s through parts of the hill country today. Rock Springs now at 99, Fredericksburg 98. But 106 in Carrizo Springs, 103 Gonzales, New Braunfels at 102. The big picture, though, not as many triple digits as what we're used to seeing lately on the map across the Lone Star State. 92 in Lubbock, and these are pretty close to the high temperatures for the day. 93 El Paso, Amarillo 90, 93 Dallas. That's because of this weak cold front, not quite as hot front. <laughs> at least for North Texas, that's moving southward. But going forward, it's really not going to have an impact on our temperatures. 104 tomorrow, that would be a record high. 107 on Thursday, that's our forecast. That would be a record high. And should that verify the hottest day so far of 2023? Stepping downward a little bit in temperatures in the next week as our pattern shifts a little bit closer to 100 by this time next week. But next Tuesday, that'll be our 57th 100 degree day so far this year. Center of the heat heights over the Four Corners region. That's actually going to slide eastward very slowly and eventually by early next week anchor it in this weekend anchor itself over Iowa and Missouri. So that's where the center of it is, which means the steering flow has the door open for disturbances. Unfortunately, we just don't have any said disturbances to move in yet. 75 in the morning, not as hot tomorrow in the morning. That is 104 by the afternoon. Divine 105 Canyon Lake 102 for the high. Notice those 10% rain chances next Mon Monday and Tuesday could see a similar setup on the radar. Yeah, 101 is looking good. That's where we are this summer. <laughs> Larry Ramirez joins us now here in the studio. He is back to talk UTSA football and a big season for Frank Harris. Yeah, so Frank Harris is entering his seventh season college football with the UTSA Roadrunners and his teammates love to joke with him about he's been around so long and he's so old, all that kind of stuff. But for real, it's one final run for number zero. And in high school football, we're going to check in with the Bernie Greyhounds as they get ready for the brand new season coming up. I do know this time is his last time. Uh, so I know this time's it. Uh, like yesterday, I haven't even said this to him, but yesterday was his last Monday practice. We don't practice on Mondays. So, I mean, that was it. He will, he will never 
be my quarterback on a Monday again. Coach Trailer is talking about quarterback Frank Harris, who's down to his final season in college football in big board sports. It is time to hang out with the Bernie Greyhounds as we continue our big game coverage previews. The Greyhounds went 15 and one last season, advancing to the UIL Class 4A Division One State Final, where they failed the China Spring 24-21. The Greyhounds have nine starters coming back this season, five on offense, four on defense. Players to watch include quarterback Jackson Bays, running back wideout TJ Dement, and DB wide receiver McCoy Bruce. Dave Campbell's Texas Football predicts Bernie will win the District 14-4A D1 Championship with Somerset finishing second. Now, the Greyhounds lost some key players from last season, but they are ready for another big run. Uh, last year, we had a great season, obviously, uh, making it to the state championship. Um, for our underclassmen, like a quarterback, Jackson Bays, only being a sophomore, he's already played 16 games uh, starting on varsity. So, I mean, he's already almost a, almost a junior as a sophomore. So, going in, I mean, it's just really good for his experience. Our O-line's young. Uh, it's just good. You know, we have a lot of good pieces moving forward. Oh, it's super important. You know, uh, we hadn't made a run like that before, and experience is definitely a thing um, that helps. Uh, and so being able to play in that environment uh, in front of that many people, I think it's definitely going to help us this year. And uh, playing teams that we play, it's just going to help us bring it each week. Bernie will kick off the regular season Friday, August 25th at 7 p.m. when they play at Corpus Christi Flower Bluff. UTSA quarterback Frank Harris keeps racking up the preseason honors. Today he was named to the Manning Award watch list. Harris has also been named to the Davey O'Brien Award, Maxwell Award, and Walter Camp Player of the Year Award watch list. Entering his seventh season, Harris owns more than 30 school records and a 31 and 11 record as the Roadrunner's starting quarterback. Harris is one of 33 QBs named to the Manning Award watch list, which is named in honor of former college football greats Archie, Eli, and Peyton Manning. Case Actual Sports' Mary Rominger has more. Larry, there's no telling what UTSA football can accomplish with a healthy Frank Harris who returns to the program for his seventh season. Fall camp is coming to a close and head coach Jeff Trailer says the left hander is throwing the football the best he's seen him throw it. He just knows the offense so well. He's got total control of it. I mean, literally, I know I've kind of each year we've given him more and more and more and more, but like he really has it all now. He, he'll check any play he wants to, protection. He's put the game plan in for all I care. I'm feeling great. You just cherish all the moments, you know, all the grind, um, all the camaraderie, being with each other all day long. Um, I know I'm going to miss it, you know, when next year comes around. ESPN revealed its preseason top 100 college football player rankings, and Harris is listed at number 32, higher than any other player out of the state of Texas. Mary Rominger, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Mary. Hey, and coming up on the night beat, Cowboys linebacker Micah Parsons had to leave practice early today with an injury, so we'll have that for you. Mm, all right. Thank you, Larry. Yep. Coming up next, our KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg. We'll be right back. In today's KSAT Q&A, as on most Tuesdays, we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. And for this segment, we like to call it affectionately Mayor on the Move. You're on the road somewhere here this evening, so we're glad you got some solid Wi-Fi so you can be with us uh, here tonight. Mayor, thanks, because I know your schedule's packed, especially with budget season, as we covered a little bit earlier in the show. We'll talk about some key items in that budget proposal here in a second, but I want to first talk to you about school safety. Yesterday in this segment, we had Congressman Tony Gonzalez join us, and he talked about your role in trying to get some federal dollars to come to San Antonio to be used for school safety. Talk about that effort and where we are now in that process. Sure. Well, Congressman Gonzalez and I spoke yesterday, and he was in town also for a roundtable with school leaders as well as uh, law enforcement to talk about the issue of school safety, which is on everyone's mind, particularly the parents who are sending their children off to school this week and, and for the rest of the month. And, you know, as a result of, you know, the challenges that we see in schools across America, but also some of the mandates provided to the school districts to uh, fund uh, school safety, uh, we'll be working together to identify areas where we can help with that. And, Part of that is some um, uh, federal dollars that he's going to be applying uh, on our behalf for in terms of, uh, you know, discretionary 
budgets and, and earmarks. And we talked about how we can work together to identify best community-wide application uh, of those dollars should they be uh, awarded uh, in the federal process. So I want to thank Congressman Gonzalez again for working uh, across the community to, to identify ways that we can shore up uh, those things that are most important to us, which is public safety, particularly for our school children. Yeah, in that roundtable he hosted yesterday, we heard from several different school leaders about funding being the issue to meet some of these requirements to have armed officers on campus, for example. It, it sounded like the, the time frame for finding out should we get that money is around October, sometime this fall. Do you know yet if we were to receive the money, if the city did that, who would be eligible for it, how it could be used? Yeah, it's, it's too early to, to say that. And, and as you know, the, the federal process is sometimes unpredictable. Uh, but what I will say is that we had a good discussion about, you know, the mutual interest that we all have with regard to school safety. And we know that in particular, uh, the mandate for all school campuses to have an armed uh, guard is one that uh, a lot of schools simply cannot afford. And so working through uh, the state mandate and also the, the you know, resources available to school districts and what the federal government could provide to help meet some of the need. Uh, that's what we'll be working with over the next uh, several months. I look forward to additional conversations with, with Congressman Gonzalez about that. Because again, uh, we won't want to do is make sure that people feel, feel safe in their communities in particular, the children who are off at school and their parents as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let's keep the conversation going here when it comes to dollars. There is a big city budget proposal on the table. We talked about that a little bit earlier, an update the city got today in terms of airport funding. I, I want to ask you about another big topic, though, in this budget, funding for animal care services. We heard from the city manager not too long ago that ACS really only has the staff to respond to about half of the calls they get about animal cruelty or aggressive dogs. How would an increase in funding make sure that that need is addressed? Yeah, so uh, keeping with public safety, the theme again, uh, public safety being job number one at the city for the departments that we manage as well, that goes for SAPD as well as animal care. And so there is a roughly 25% increase in the animal care services budget this year, and that is in part to help augment uh, spay and neuter services to control uh, the stray pet population, but also to res respond to those calls that we get for dangerous animals. Uh, and as you, as you just said, um, the only department in the city where a call uh, does not get responded to is, is really an ACS because of the limited resources that have been available to that department for a long time. Something like 44% of calls are responded to within 24 hours. So we need to do better at that. Uh, the city has put forth recommendations and I look forward to the city council uh, following through with additional funding to, to help support the ACS strategic plan. On the public, on the police department side, there's a number of things going on. Um, we talked several times about uh, what's happening with patrol. We're trying to move from a 40% proactive and 60% reactive operational model with patrolling in SAPD to a 60-40 proactive reactive. And that's going to require a significant number of more patrol officers on the street. Uh, so in this year's budget, we're going to be adding 105 police officer positions. Um, and that's en route to adding an additional uh, 360 in total over the next three to five years. So we're beginning the process with a lot of good data and analysis and our partners from our partners in UTSA uh, to help us again respond to the uh, to the constituent concerns and also get us to an operational model that we are more effective and more efficient for, for the San Antonio community. Another issue that was tops for San Antonians in a budget survey was the issue of homelessness. And I understand there is funding in this budget proposal to increase the number of homeless camp cleanups that would happen in the yeah. next fiscal year, funding about 700 of those. But so often yeah. we see those camps cleaned up and then hours later, people return to those same sites. So right. what can the city do to make sure that a, people have the help that they need, but also you're not spending money for a problem that continues to occur hours after a cleanup. And thank you for saying that, Myra, because obviously encampments are something we are concerned about. 
Uh, but if we just focus on encampments and, and you know, folks who uh, are concerned about that, if the only solution is to clean up the encampment, then we're just moving the problem from one place to another. What we've got to do is make sure that we outreach to folks to really get to the root causes of homelessness and provide services, whether that's, you know, uh, health services, uh, substance abuse services, uh, help to get an ID so they can apply for a job. There's a lot of different things that are underlying the symptom of homelessness, and we've got to get to those root causes. So before there's an encampment cleanup, there's a lot of outreach to connect people with the services that they need uh, to stay off the street permanently. Now, the problem that has we've encountered over, you know, and every city has over decades, is that we just don't have uh, all of the resources in the entire spectrum of need and the community uh, for those types of services and also for the different types of shelters that we need to get folks into and off of the streets. Uh, and so over the last several years, we've been working comprehensively to, to identify and fill the gaps in the spectrum of homelessness services. And we're now at a point with this year's budget and with the work that's gone on in the previous years, including introducing more low barrier shelter opportunities, more permanent supportive shelter that has those services attached to the housing where we have places for people to go. So now that the encampments are happening or the, the encampment cleanups are happening and we're doing that outreach, we actually have places for people to be connected to they, so they can stay permanently off the street. It's not about just cleaning up the encampments. It's about making sure that people who are in the encampments have opportunity to get on their feet and off of the streets uh, permanently. All right, Mayor, thanks so much for joining us here this evening and safe travels. Thanks so much, Mara. Have a good night. We'll be right back.